Oh my gosh, Mark, you're still the best of them all in the whole world, Tracy squealed with delight. This was good news. This was also bad news. Her compliment hit me like a blow to the head, and I immediately stopped abruptly, sucking in air like a vacuum cleaner. Wait a fucking minute. We have been married for 29 years. She shouldn't even remember what the other man is like, let alone comment on it out loud during what was a great sex session. My God, Mark, you know exactly how to turn my world upside down, Tracy exclaimed. I just continued to lie there with my head on her left thigh. I made no move to continue. Tracy lay there for about 30 more seconds, also breathing heavily. I wondered if she had any idea what she had just announced. Aren't you going to continue? She asked, looking slightly puzzled. No, I'm tired, baby. You took all my strength. She leaned over and kissed me before laying back down. Usually after I finished, we would cuddle for a while and then finally head to the bathroom to clean up a bit. But as I was just laying in bed, Tracy dozed off. And a minute later, I heard the soft sound of her rhythmic breathing. Dream. I quietly got up, went to the bathroom, and cleaned myself up a bit, then went downstairs to my wine cabinet. Sometimes it's a real bitch to have an above-average IQ that doesn't turn off very often. Most guys would have been too engrossed in what they were doing to actually hear, let alone pay attention to what Tracy was saying. But I'm not like most other guys. As I sat in my robe and sipped a glass of Staley's rye whiskey, I racked my brain for clues that I had apparently missed that might indicate to me that something was missing in my marriage, but nothing seemed out of the ordinary, except for the fact that Tracy and I were having sex more often than we had in years. I explained this by saying that now that our youngest had left for college six months ago, Tracy and I were alone for the first time in 25 years. Tracy lost 20 pounds in those six months and started dressing a lot sexier to show the world that she was back to her college weight of 120 and that she had invested in those 120 pounds. At 51, Tracy had the body of a goddess, with perfect breasts and a small waist, on top of great legs for a woman of average height. She's always been a beauty in the looks department, and for her age, she has amazing skin, inherited from her mother that looks pretty good for her 78 years old, so to speak. Even with the extra 20 pounds she had been carrying around for several years, until recently, Tracy was always giddy, and I knew she always would be when we first met as college sophomores. We dated for two years before finally getting married at 22. She's always been a little flirty, probably because she can afford it with her looks, but I've never once worried about her crossing an imaginary line until just a few minutes ago. Damn it. She thinks that just because she has big breasts, all she has to do is smile at a guy and he belongs to her. Whatever the case, give her a couple more years and she'll put those breasts in her belt, and if they ever looked on the other side, they would see that cheesecake ass that we all see. Rhonda Nichols was talking to someone in the company break room six months ago, unaware that the target of her vitriol was right down the hall and could hear every word of her diatribe. Tracy Robertson, the top sales agent at Midland Realty, had interrupted a conversation between Rhonda and the third agent, Carl Walters, not five minutes earlier by simply walking by and smiling. Even though Rhonda was already talking to him about something, Carl turned his head and followed Tracy with his eyes as she walked by, much to Rhonda's annoyance and Tracy's own amusement. It's been this way for Tracy since she was 14 years old and her tits started growing much larger than most of her friends. It didn't hurt that Tracy was blonde, blue-eyed, and, let's face it, beautiful. However, Tracy had to admit to herself that she was about 20 pounds over her college weight of 120 pounds. But she still didn't think she looked too bad for her 51 years, and don't forget that she had two children. The comment about the cheesecake butt, however, was inappropriate. She thought of Rhonda, a 26-year-old and decent-looking, if a little thin girl, as a friend. Besides, why does Rhonda care about Carl? She was engaged to Fred, a rather handsome accountant. Carl was the new agent in the office. At 28, he was several years older than his days as a starting linebacker at Ohio State, but he still kept himself in great shape by hitting the gym regularly. He was 6 feet, 4 inches, 230 pounds, 
incredibly handsome May, and his cloth is looked good, Tracy thought to herself. The game has begun, Tracy mentally admonished herself. Tracy skipped lunch with the girls and instead went to the gym near the office where she signed up for a membership. Mrs. Cheese Ass was going to make Rhonda pay dearly for her indiscretion, Tracy thought as she got back into her car and drove away. As I sat in my den on my third drink, my thoughts were all over the place. I was transported back in time to when Tracy and I first met at a large Midwestern university. I was a nerd who specialized in mathematics. I'm not a bad guy and I worked out regularly, but honestly, Tracy was a goddess. And in real life, goddesses don't date geeks. I knew who she was, but I never even talked to her. There always seemed to be a lot of guys hanging around her, waiting to be her next boyfriend. I saw her at a few parties and then a few times on campus, and although I thought she was beautiful, I had no reason to even approach her when all the good-looking guys were practically throwing themselves to the ground in front of her. A few weeks later, I was sitting quietly in the corner drinking beer at another party when someone plopped down in the empty seat next to me and started chatting, disturbing my thoughts. I was shocked when I turned my head and saw the goddess of several of my dreams right next to me. So, are you homosexual or bisexual? She asked. It's okay, man. I'm not against either, but you have to be one or the other, because there hasn't been a single straight guy who hasn't tried to chat with me since I was 15, and I don't see a ring on your finger, which means you're not married. So, what is it? I immediately turned the brightest blush of my life and started stuttering like a fucking idiot. The girl's t-shirt practically fluttered with every breath she took. She was just as beautiful up close as she was across the room, and I instantly began to get aroused. My genius-level IQ couldn't process what I was facing. So that's how it is, she said, staring at my crotch. N n no I finally croaked. Neither one nor the other. I just didn't think you'd have time for someone like me with all the handsome guys lined up in front of you. Well, you don't put yourself out there, honey. We women sometimes like our men to be a little mysterious. We left the party together and got married right after graduating from university. I wasn't kidding myself. I knew Tracy's number was higher than mine when we got together. But I knew what to do with a girl when she's in my bed. And that included using more than just rhythmic sex to please her. I will say that I am quite talented, and I don't think any of the women I have ever slept with would disagree with that statement. I turned Tracy into a pile of quivering jelly on our first night, and I can still do it today, even though she doesn't seem to want me to do it anymore. And then there was tonight. Tracy and I didn't make love for two weeks, which was about the longest period of our lives, except for the time when she had our children. Either she was tired or she was not in the mood. Then I forgot what the excuse was. I didn't actually ask a fourth time. She was standing at the kitchen sink, rinsing a pot, so her hands were full. I walked up behind her, cupped both of her wonderful big breasts in my hands, and started playing with her. She tried to push me away, but I removed my hand from her chest and put it in my sweatpants. I took the pan from her hands and led her to our bedroom. I undressed her in seconds. As usual, she just screamed, unintelligibly, but later she actually began to say words. For the first time in 29 years of marriage, she was talkative. I wasn't bothered when she screamed, hell yes, hell yes, hell yes. In fact, I was enjoying it, until of course she came out with her assessment of my skills, and then it all got real, too real. Tracy's campaign to seduce Carl Walters began in earnest two weeks after the breakroom incident. She and Carl were working on a deal, which gave Tracy the perfect excuse to invite him to dinner. On the surface, it was no different from the time she invited other agents to lunch to discuss work, since she was not only the senior agent in the office, but also the number one producer. Usually, the higher rank paid for lunch. In this case, she made sure that Rhonda was well informed about the dinner. Tracy was professional enough to figure out the business first. After all, a deal is a deal and a payday is a payday. Then, with things settled, Tracy apparently flipped the switch and became Carl's new hottest, if not best, friend. Over a bottle of wine, she learned almost everything about Carl, 
from his football days to his personal life. Yes, he told her. He did have a girlfriend, but they weren't exclusive yet. Tracy made sure to touch Carl's arm and wrist several times as they sat at the table talking. Her forest green professional blazer was unbuttoned and her crisp white top was tight and unbuttoned to the top of her large breasts, as Carl could see. During the conversation, she leaned forward several times and after a while, glancing quickly at the young man's lap, she realized that she had achieved the desired effect. It's so easy with men, she thought to herself. He is mine, but he doesn't know it yet. When I lose another five pounds, then I'll show him his gift. The private investigator I hired was worth a lot of the money I was planning on spending on a vacation to Hawaii this year. But given what he found, I think we weren't going to take that vacation after all. Apparently, Tracy was regularly having sex with the new realtor in her office, Carl Walters, as well as some guy named Fred Lazarus, and worse, her trainer at the gym. The private investigator seemed shy as hell while giving me his report, and I had to wonder if he was also going to go after my cheating wife. While not a complete nerd, I have made an eclectic group of friends over the years. One of my oldest friendships was with a lawyer named Martin Bolins. Like me, Marty was something of a smart, geeky guy. But I knew that if I ever got in trouble and needed a lawyer, Marty would have my back until the very end. Maybe he couldn't possibly snap a pencil in half. But I've heard stories of him having no problem crushing a soul or two to make sure his clients won their cases and we both agreed that Tracy should be punished for adultery. We didn't live in a guilt-free state, so why let her hide behind a veil of irreconcilable differences? Tracy only planned to sleep with Fred Lazarus once. He was the fiancé of Rhonda, who called her a cheese-ass, and Tracy's lesson to Rhonda was to let her fiancé enjoy a real woman's body. They'll have to keep it a secret from Rhonda, but Tracy will be able to smirk at this woman for ages. However, it turned out that Fred Lazarus had nine inches of dignity on his 25-year-old body and was a very skilled swordsman. And that night she decided that she would enjoy the young man much more than once. She'd find some excuse to use him instead of Carl sometimes, or maybe just give Mark another excuse as to why she had to be away. Not that she cared much about his feelings. Darren Trimble as a lover was completely unplanned. He was one of the trainers at the gym she joined, and while she admired his muscular physique, she had no intention of sleeping with him. That all changed when the young man gave Tracy a one-on-one -on -one workout, during which he placed his strong hands on her shoulders while demonstrating the exercise. Tracy immediately felt a tingling sensation from her shoulders to her heels and gently but firmly pushed her ass back to rub against Darren. The young man didn't hesitate to grab Tracy, and within 15 minutes the pair were in Darren's tiny flat, grabbing each other and tearing off their sportswear with the urgency of a couple on the first night of their honeymoon. She arrived home from Darren's apartment about 30 minutes later than usual, and was still in her workout clothes when Mark walked in about five minutes later. She quickly went upstairs to take a shower before going downstairs to start dinner, and her husband didn't seem to understand. Tracy was still in her workout clothes, and when I came home from work the other day, apparently she had just walked in. While I knew she was working out regularly now, as evidenced by her newly toned body, she was now also working out with a trainer, as my detective had reported a few weeks ago, so I assumed it had been a damn longer run than planned. She had a scared look on her face and didn't even bother going over for a quick greeting kiss like usual, and practically ran upstairs and got into the shower, all the while muttering about needing to wash the sweat off her body. The excuse would have worked if not for my private investigator's report. I'm sure at that moment Tracy thought she was ten feet tall and bulletproof. Despite how angry I was with her, I controlled myself in the evening when we were both home. She was putting away the dishes after dinner, and I was watching TV in the living room when the doorbell rang. She shouted at me to come over, but after making sure through the window that it was the processing server, I politely asked her to open the door herself. She chuckled at me, opened the door, and, a little later, staggered into the living room, holding a banal manila envelope in her hands. What the hell? She hissed at me, looking at the opened envelope. How could you do this to me? What about our family? You're just upset that I pulled the trigger on you. 
I replied dispassionately. If you had a little more time, you would have done this to me yourself. You don't love me anymore. As I understand, this hasn't been the case for some time. I know of others, or at least some others. I started to choke when I finished speaking. Tracy began to blush deeply, and her look turned from shock to rage. You think you know something? Then go ahead and say it. I'm all ears. Carl Walters, Fred Lazarus, and... And... I reached into my pocket for a small piece of paper. Darren Trimble. Yes, that's who I know about. Tracy's face changed expression again. This time it looked like the face of someone who had been punched in the gut. She sat down on the sofa opposite me. I guess she was pretty sure that at best I had suspicions and not answers. Well, I think if you were more courageous, we wouldn't be discussing this, she spat at me. I guess I shouldn't have been surprised that she immediately went into attack mode. Having sex with three guys behind my back must have been a huge boost to her self-confidence. Well, it's not my fault that I'm getting older, I sighed. Apparently 29 years wasn't enough to earn me a loyalty discount. Hell, none of these bastards were even alive when we got married. Tracy's eyebrows shot up at that statement. Yes, not only did I know that she had lovers, but I also had information about these guys. She looked like she wanted to continue down this path, but then she stopped herself. I'll let you stay in the house until we can sell it. I'll let you explain everything to the children and your parents, I said quietly. I stood up from my chair, went to the closet in the hallway, and pulled out two packed suitcases. She definitely didn't expect this. I'll come by in a few days and pick up the rest of my things. Hire your own lawyer, decide what you want to do, and call Marty. It's obvious that you don't care about me anymore, so let's do this quickly and get this over with. I have no idea what flew and crashed against the wall as I walked through the doorway. Although Mark was right and Tracy planned to divorce him, she wasn't quite ready to take that step. She was figuring out in her mind how to twist everything so that her husband would look like the bad guy in this matter. She knew that Mark was well-liked by their friends, and it wouldn't take them long to completely side with him. As for the kids, she planned to be a little more direct, attacking his masculinity and hoping the girls would see the logic in her desire to have mind-blowing sex several times a week. Tracy had to admit to herself that Mark's action had taken her by surprise. She wondered if anyone had seen her with one of her lovers and told her husband, never realizing that she herself was the source of the leak, so to speak. But it still didn't seem like Mark's world was as devastated by it as she'd imagined it would be when she finally served him with the divorce papers. She was somewhat alarmed at how well he was holding up. In fact, he seemed to almost enjoy the situation. I was proud of myself when I left the house with my two suitcases. I could tell that Tracy wasn't expecting what hit her and that I seemed to have everything in hand. I drove to the nearest motel and checked in. It's time to start life again. Tracy was only struggling with one aspect of the divorce, but she fought it tooth and nail. She wanted me to change the reason to irreconcilable differences instead of adultery. She still got 50% of everything, so it wasn't about the money. But I had a feeling that she was going to twist the situation a little in front of the kids and her parents to make me look like the bad guy. So leaving the case under the heading of adultery gave me enough leverage. There is no reason why everyone should know about our personal affairs, she shouted to me one evening on the phone. Just change the statement to irreconcilable differences, and I'll sign on the dotted line immediately. I know us geeks can be a little socially awkward at times, Tracy, but your logic here is so clear it shows right through. I won't give you a chance to lie to anyone to get out of this if anyone decides to look at the court records. You made the decision to entertain other men while we were still married, so now we're your scarlet brand. All you had to do was show me some respect and divorce me before you became the town slut. Tracy tried to humiliate me by spreading rumors that I was weak in bed. I heard from a couple of my buddies who got the information from their wives. I think Tracy decided that I would rather give in than let everyone think I was a weakling. It was hard, but what really hurt was when my youngest daughter, Allison, accused me of stalking Tracy to ease my bruised ego. If your mother wants to play like that, let's go, baby. I'm guessing she's already told you about her affair. Well, what they probably didn't tell you is that she's having sex with three guys a little older than your sister. Three, I said, 
holding up the appropriate number of fingers to make it easy for my daughter to count. I may not have been the man I was when I was your age, but I can still take care of myself as well as anyone. But it's not about me. We're talking about your mother turning into a self-centered bitch. Three fucking guys, Ellie. Three. Doesn't she love me anymore? Okay. But she didn't have to have sex with three fucking guys who should be dating you, not your mother. Allison looked shocked and began stuttering and crying as she stood in my kitchen. I've never spoken to her so harshly, and I've never said anything bad about Tracy in front of her. Allison staggered out of my apartment after my outburst, looking lost and confused. It took all my willpower to let her walk out the door, rather than pick her up and give her a reassuring, fatherly hug. Twenty minutes later, I received a call from Tracy's mother, Barb, who had not spoken to me since I filed for divorce. We used to have a great relationship. How could you say such horrible things to my granddaughter, you idiot? She screamed at me when I answered the phone. This girl used to worship the ground you walked on. Now she's lying on my couch crying her eyes out. How could you say such terrible things about Tracy? Mom, please listen for a second. Obviously you've only heard one side of it and it's definitely not mine. She has three guys for sex that you can ask her about. And if you still don't believe me, I have visual proof. Barb inhaled enough air to launch the weather balloon. Oh my God, Mark, do you have photos? Videos? Yes, Mom, I said quietly. I wasn't planning on using the nuclear option, but apparently your daughter thinks scorched earth is necessary. No, no, Mark, it is not necessary. I will talk to her. Three guys, Mark. Really? I'm so sorry, Mark. I'm really sorry. I really am. She hung up quietly. I shook my head as I hung up. Barb has been a mother to me since my death about 12 years ago. I could always talk to her and discuss some of my problems. Now, not only are we not talking, but I just crushed her soul by telling her that her daughter was so stupid and merciless and I had physical evidence. The divorce was eventually granted on the grounds of adultery, although it took a year. I guess Tracy continued to entertain her three young boys all this time, but I didn't know for sure because I wasn't watching her anymore. For me, let's just say that life has gotten really interesting. About a month after filing for divorce, a couple of women from the university's science department came down separately to my basement office in the math building to see how I was doing. Even though they had both worked here for several years, I barely knew either of them and probably didn't say more than ten words to either of them during the time they were here. It was nice of them to show concern, I told them, still somewhat confused as to why they would even want to comfort me, and I had their numbers if I felt I needed to talk. I have to admit, they were both good-looking, with one being divorced and in her fifties and the other widowed in her forties. Things like this became a regular occurrence over the next few weeks, with women from all over campus stopping by to check on my well-being. One day, as I was leaving my office, the administrative secretary of the mathematics department walked by and gave me a radiant smile. Okay, Colin, spit it out. What's going on with everyone lately? Did I just inherit some money that I don't know about? You seriously don't have a clue, do you? Colleen asked in an almost mocking tone. She was a 35-year-old divorcee with curves in all the right places. Colleen had raven hair and green eyes. I had noticed the sparkle in her eyes before, but now, for the first time, I really looked at her and noticed how beautiful she was. It's because of your recent weight loss, Mark, she explained. She raised her left hand and moved her fingers, placing special emphasis on her ring finger. You recently lost 120 pounds. You were always considered a nice, sweet guy, but you were an outlaw because you were married and everyone knew you were hooked on your wife. But with your ring missing, let's just say it's hunting season. There may be a lot of available guys around, but not a lot of good ones. You've simply become a rare commodity. Beautiful, smart, nice, and lonely. I don't know who saw the divorce papers, but within hours it spread all over campus. But the divorce has not been finalized yet. I won't be a free man for a few more months. I mean, that's very flattering, but... Everyone wants to make sure that when you become available, you know that they are waiting for you. By the way, 
I'm applying too, Dr. Robertson. Um, okay, I'll put your application in the queue. Really? You are so charming. Tracy knew that although Mark was angry with her, he wasn't the type of man to talk about his personal situation all over town. So she decided that she could at least keep her personal situation a secret for a while. This assessment was proven wrong within two weeks and continued to be proven wrong until the divorce was made final about a year later. Are you crazy, woman? I know you're a goddess and you know it, but how could you let the sweetest guy in the world leave you? Marge Rochambeau, Tracy's oldest and closest friend, asked this when she called Tracy about a month after Mark applied. Oh, shit. How did she already know about this? Tracy thought to herself. Marge lived in Tracy's hometown, about two hours north. Tracy decided, wrongly, as it turned out, that she had at least a couple of months before she had to worry about telling most of her friends, family, and acquaintances. Someone in Tracy's family must have spilled the beans, regardless of Tracy's belief that they, like Mark, would remain silent. Okay. It's a long story, Marge, Tracy began slowly, trying to figure out how to tell her friend the whole truth, at least for now. Well, I heard most of it from my mom after she tried to give me the slip and then broke down and cried like a baby at Walmart last week, Marge called Tracy's mother, Barb Mom, almost from the moment she and Tracy became friends when the girls were in second grade. When Marge ran into Barb at the store, she asked about Tracy, Marge said, and Barb began to stutter and then ramble before finally bursting into tears. Once Marge calmed Barb down enough for her to make sense, she got the full unfiltered story. You cheated on a wonderful boyfriend, a wonderful husband, a wonderful father, and a wonderful provider because he got older and you thought you deserved better. What about him, Tracy? You're about to be an old woman yourself, and I bet you're not quite the same woman you were when you were 30. Have you considered this scenario at all? Marge howled into the phone. I always knew you had a selfish side, but I never thought you would ever show it to Mark. On the day the divorce became official, Mark was sitting in his apartment. He ate a small salad and drank half of a 750 millender meal Buffalo Trace bourbon. Tracy, on the other hand, invited Carl to a fancy dinner and then they went back to his house. It was a scene they had repeated many times over the past year and several months, but for some reason Tracy found herself unable to keep the candle lit. She didn't like what was happening, but admit that this to yourself, or even more so to him, was absolutely impossible. When it was finally over, she told him she was tired and needed to go home. She carefully removed Carl's hands from her chest, got dressed and left noting as she got into the car that her first official night as a divorced woman was far from successful. I have a genius IQ. I can crack passwords in my head and read four books at the same time. But I have no fucking clue how to understand a woman, I told Judy Scalise, a longtime friend of Tracy and I, as we had dinner on my first official date two weeks after the divorce became official. I chose Judy because she was an old friend of mine, and I decided there would be no misunderstanding between us. I thought I had you girls figured out, but apparently I was just fooling myself for 30 years. So what should I do next? Judy was an artist, and I always found her thought processes to be quite unique. She was a couple of years younger than me and kept fit with regular stretching and yoga, and her smooth skin also belied her age. She had dark brown hair and blue eyes that looked like they could penetrate my soul. I found myself starting to think about her naked in my bed. I was hoping you would call eventually, Mark, she replied. However, I didn't think I'd be number one on your list, so I'm very honored. But let's not waste time talking about you and Tracy. This can be discussed over a cup of coffee at noon. Tonight, let's be two adults living our own lives and see what happens. How about we move on? I nodded my head. I agree. You can't move forward if you're busy looking back. I stood up, leaned towards Judy and planted what I hoped was a firm kiss on her soft lips. She also stood up, leaned over the table towards me, and tried to suck my tonsils out of my mouth. I almost choked when she allowed me to gasp for air. Before that night, I had never thought about Judy in a sexual way, 
Yes, she was a beautiful woman and I could appreciate her great body, but I just didn't lust after other women when I was married. Firstly, I was married, and secondly, why would I lust after another woman when I was married to a goddess? I was out of the game, so to speak, for a hell of a long time, and I think it showed. I don't think my complexion returned to my normal color until the end of the meal, but I tried to relax and be calm. I think I managed to have a coherent conversation. We ate a slice of cheesecake and each had coffee for dessert. And then, I think we need to go back to my house for a real nightcap, Mark, Judy said, looking into my eyes. If I'm not mistaken, you haven't had sex since you left Tracy. I would like to be your first after the queen. I know it sounds stupid, but I was actually afraid to have sex with Judy. It had been a long time, and I knew I wouldn't last long. And then I would need time to recharge, since I'm not 21 anymore. And since Judy was a friend of both Tracy and me, well, I wouldn't want the whole town to know about my failure. Dr. Markland Robertson, genius, professor of computational physics at the university, is a loser in bed. I could see how everyone would think that Tracy was right to leave me since I was an underachiever, where it really mattered. Judy made coffee when we got to her house and then excused herself to change into something more comfortable. My head was spinning. Judy returned wearing what looked like a terry robe made of a pullover with straps that only reached mid-thigh. Her nipples stuck out through the thin terry cloth, showing me that she had taken off her bra. I was more than a little interested. We sat together on her couch, drinking coffee and chatting innocently. I tried not to drool. Mark, wake up. Mark. I heard Judy's voice from somewhere deep in my brain. Oh my gosh, is there a drool running down my chin? I thought. Judy carefully took the coffee cup from my hand, placed it on the edge of the table, and quietly led me into her bedroom. I wasn't quite in this world when she slowly undressed me completely. Wow. Slow down, I said quietly as my brain began to work. A lot of time has passed, and I'm not quite ready for it all to end quickly. Relax, Mark. I understand, Judy replied. We can do this again. I'm patient. But I'm not that patient, I answered, taking off her robe. I'd say everything went well. Did you seriously have to be that irresistible? Judy half said, half asked, as we lay on the bed side by side, looking into each other's eyes. Well, yeah, that's what I'm here for, isn't it? I answered. Oh my God, Mark! Judy moved closer to me and then turned her back so I could hug her. So we fell asleep, and I slept like a log for several hours before I woke up to the wonderful feeling of Judy from the waist down. Good morning, Sonia. Good morning to you, too, I answered with pleasure. You are incomparable, honey, she said, looking me straight in the eyes. Tracy met Judy for lunch at one of their favorite places about a month later. Tracy called and invited Judy to a meeting, and although the two were friends in their own right, Judy knew that the dinner was about the time she spent with Tracy's ex. Judy had met Mark a couple of times before, and she didn't think this call was too random. The first ten minutes were spent discussing the latest news and each other's children before Tracy finally fired the opening salvo. Lots of dates, Judy? Really? I thought you didn't exercise anymore, Tracy said with a cat purr. She took a sip of her margarita and waited. Judy felt herself blush as Tracy made her statement. Although she knew what awaited her, she suddenly felt less comfortable than she thought. What she thought would just be a quick one-off way to satisfy her own curiosity became something a little more personal when Mark Robertson gave her some mind-blowing dates. This man sure was a master at sex, Judy thought to herself. Is he always this good? Judy asked like an awestruck teenager. Tracy was somewhat puzzled by Judy's assessment of her ex-husband's talents, because Tracy suggested that Mark wouldn't use all his chips on a mistress like he did on his wife, and suggested that the sex with Judy was mediocre. Judy's reaction told Tracy that Mark had rocked her world, and she confirmed it seconds later. How could you let this man leave your life? Are you crazy, little sister? Smart, handsome, sweet, and damned wizard. Tracy's smile disappeared from her face. She took a quick sip of her margarita and sort of raised her eyebrows in response, then quickly changed the subject as she set her drink down.
Judy saw that her praise of Mark was not at all what Tracy had expected. Not wanting to show Tracy her luck, she allowed Tracy to steer the conversation away from Mark. Molly Hamilton was pressed against my right side, her right hand on my chest, breathing rhythmically in her sleep. We had just finished a wild sex session. What we were doing was definitely not lovemaking, and I was tired too. I was beat up, sticky, and definitely felt like a million bucks. If I live to be 100, I will never understand women. My ex-wife cheated on me because I couldn't give her what she needed sexually, she said. So, I just slept with my third woman in the last three months. I had possibly the best sex of my entire life. And I made this 32-year-old scream like a banshee and nearly pass out. I can't put it all together. Molly is a physician assistant who works in an orthopedic clinic. I know it sounds corny, but I actually met her at the gym. She was working out hard on the machines, sweat was running down her face, and she was filling out her tight workout uniform really well. I usually take a quick glance at cute girls and then move on. But this babe was happy to flex her legs, even grunting as she stood up, and with her tousled hair covered in sweat, I knew she was here to work, not to attract a partner. That's why she attracted me. I waited until she finished her workout and headed to her locker before cautiously approaching her. I haven't dated too many women since my divorce, despite many making it clear that they would like to be asked out. But there was something about her appearance and her efforts at the gym. I introduced myself and asked if I could invite her over for coffee and dessert one evening. She hesitated for a moment, and I saw the light in her green eyes change shape before agreeing. She asked for my number, then entered her name and number. We smiled at each other. Then I looked at her beautiful ass as she turned and walked out of the gym. Before she could walk out the door, I called her on the phone. I know it seems pretty desperate, but now is a good time to ask this question. How about Thursday evening? I asked. She turned around and looked at me through the glass of the door. She smiled widely, and I think maybe my heart skipped a beat. So it's Thursday evening. I'll meet you at Laszlo's at seven, she said into the phone. Needless to say, the rest of my workout went great. That night, absolutely nothing hurt. On Thursday night, I arrived at Laszlo's at 6.50, found a small table in the back and ordered cheesecakes. Less than two minutes later, Molly showed up with her long blonde hair pulled back into a ponytail, wearing tight jean shorts and a t-shirt that didn't quite reach the top of her shorts. She was showing off the results of her ab workouts at the gym, and I couldn't blame her. They were definitely impressive. Her breasts looked a little small, but they seemed to be in good symmetry with the rest of her body. Plus, she probably would have attracted too much attention if she was a little bigger because she wasn't wearing a bra, and it was easy to see when she walked up to me. I was sitting at a high top desk, so Molly had to sit up to sit in her chair while I held it for her and her braless tits kind of bounced when she sat down. She caught me looking at the rebound and raised an eyebrow in question. So I smiled and nodded back at her. We ate cheesecake, drank coffee, and talked for two hours. I found myself bewitched by this woman, who was not much older than my daughters. I don't know if she was as keen on me, but she agreed to go out with me in a week, starting on Saturday. We visited the antique car museum before heading to a restaurant for a bite to eat. We then headed back to my apartment, and the rest, as they say, is history. Obviously, the old man still had something left in the tank. While Mark was falling asleep, on the other side of town, Tracy was getting pleasured hard and fast from a young guy she had met earlier in the evening. She again did not dress herself up as she would have liked. Shouldn't this have been more fun? she thought to herself as she got into the car to drive home. She took a quick look in the rearview mirror, and although she liked what she saw, something was definitely wrong, she thought to herself. Carl broke up with her a month ago, saying he wanted to start dating someone who was looking for marriage and children, two things Tracy couldn't give him. Carl was right, and he was nice about the breakup. But as Tracy realized then, she had been dumped for the second time in a row, first Mark, then Carl. Tracy was able to rationalize Carl's departure by noting to herself that sex with him was becoming stale. At times, she seemed disinterested. 
This shouldn't have happened to someone like me, she thought in the deepest recesses of her mind. As Tracy pulled into the driveway, she told herself that the next time she went out, maybe she should look for someone more her age. They might not be as hot as the younger guys, but maybe she would actually be interested in what they were talking about. Spending time with Molly only reinforced in my mind what I had always believed about Tracy. From my limited experience before I met Tracy, I always felt that she was not nearly as good at sex as others I had slept with before her, and I truly believed that it was because she was a goddess, and she knew it. Women like Tracy don't have to work hard to attract guys, and at the same time, that's probably why they didn't work very hard in bed. At first they don't need it. Guys get pleasure from the fact that they manage to get a beauty with big breasts. But after a while it's not the same thrill, especially if the woman is selfish and doesn't really give it her all. Tracy and I have had a few gentle discussions about this over the years, but I've never been able to really go ahead and tell her that she's just not that good in bed. So I just went with it because I loved her. But Judy, Katie, and now Molly had shown me what great sex could be. And as I got into bed and started to fall asleep, I thought that Tracy had tricked me again. Two weeks later, I picked up the phone to hear Tracy on the line. I was more than a little surprised and a little suspicious. I didn't talk to her for months, and when I was with my daughters, they didn't talk about her at all because they knew I wouldn't talk about her to them. Although I wanted my daughters to love and respect their mother, I told them in no uncertain terms that my relationship with their mother was over and they needed to respect that, and so far they have succeeded. Mark, April wants to know if we can be civil to each other long enough to survive her wedding. Looks like Robert has finally popped the question, and she wants us to get married, but only if we don't intend to act like enemies. Well, I haven't heard from April yet. But you can assure her that I will be the perfect gentleman, especially if you remember that you were the woman I once loved. And I will pass this on to our daughter when she officially calls to tell me her good news. April called the next day to tell me her good news, and I told her the same thing I told her mother. She informed me that Tracy was going to help her plan the event, and I told her to have the time of her life, and I was more than willing to pay for it. I'm not overly emotional, but I have to admit that when I walked April down the aisle, I was shocked. My little girl put aside her dolls, silly songs, and love for toys and grew into a beautiful woman, both inside and out. The walk down the aisle only lasted a couple of minutes, but in those 30 steps, I saw hundreds of images flashing before my eyes. When I handed it over to Robert at the altar, a river of happy tears flowed down my cheeks. I walked over to our family and stood next to Tracy, who leaned over and kissed me passionately on the cheek. She was crying, too. We did a waltz for our father-daughter dance, and I thought it went well. Robert and his mother, Isabel, then danced a mother-son dance to the foxtrot. After that, the music became more modern, and for the most part, the hall was filled with people in their twenties and thirties. I stood at the bar for about ten minutes, drinking a single malt scotch before making my move. Tracy was on the dance floor with one of the thirty-odd guys slow dancing when I walked up and asked him if he minded if I intervened. He seemed a little embarrassed, but Tracy lit up like a Christmas tree and extended her hand towards me, making the decision for the boy. You don't trust me with these kids? Tracy teased, looking at me somehow sideways. Thanks to you, I think half the population knows that I am a slut. That young man you just sent away pressed his manhood against my stomach and hoped that he would go home with the mother of the bride. If that's what you want, I'll bring him here in a second, I replied. But I thought that at least for a while, you'd enjoy talking and dancing with someone who doesn't think Beyonce is a living legend. Touché, she answered. Well, unless you pull out a knife and kill me right here on the dance floor, I think we've been pretty good this weekend, don't we? I asked seriously. I should have agreed, but for a moment I thought the bride was going to have a panic attack when you approached me on the dance floor, Tracy giggled. Well, we haven't been very mature towards each other lately, I admitted. But still, at least we waited until they left the house before we exploded, she replied. We danced through a couple of slow songs, then as the music sped up, her previous dance partner returned and politely asked it if he could switch roles with me and intervene. 
I think Tracy was a little surprised when I agreed. Ellie joined me at our table when I returned from the bar. She sat next to me, watching her mother on the dance floor. Without taking her eyes off the floor, she asked in a joking tone, You think I'll have to worry about men stalking her when she's in a nursing home? I glanced sideways at my daughter, not wanting her to see me checking her expression. Her tone may have been joking, but her eyes told me she wasn't joking. But what about you, Dad? Mom tells me that you date from time to time, but replacing her is proving to be an impossible task. I'm fine. Better than fine, actually, baby, I replied. Your mom doesn't know as much about my life now as she thinks she does, but all I will say is that I have no shortage of female attention, and I'm not trying to replace her. I'll deal with this if I want. Just then, Wendy Adams, an old family friend, came to our table. Wendy and her husband, Earl, have been friends with Tracy and I since the children were little. Earl died a few years ago from cancer, and I know Wendy and Tracy still kept in touch. I didn't see her that much because Earl and I were best friends. Wendy was a couple of years younger than me, but judging by the tightness of her dress, she kept herself in pretty good shape. I invited her to join Allison and me at the table, but she just smiled and asked Allison if she would excuse us while we hit the dance floor. Allison seemed a little surprised at first, but then kindly told us to get out and shake ourselves. As we headed toward the dance floor, Allison grabbed my hand and leaned over to whisper, Coincidences like this only happen in movies, Dad. We danced to a couple of songs, then went to the bar, went and sat in the comfortable chairs right outside the room. We talked for a bit. Then Wendy took my hand, looked really serious in my eyes, and asked the $64,000 question, Are you still in love with her, Mark? Because if that's the case, then I don't need to make a fool of myself and invite you to dinner. I didn't see this coming. I thought Wendy was pretty close to Tracy, so I never even thought about asking her out, even though she was lovely. I always thought Earl was lucky to have her, and I must admit I was a little surprised that she wasn't snatched up right after the appropriate time of mourning had passed. I will always love her to some extent, despite what she did to me. Maybe it's like a smoking habit, but I'm not in love with her and I don't love her with all my soul, I replied. But you and her, I don't want to create any problems between you two. I forgot that one of Wendy's best qualities was her approach to life. She quickly reminded me, Mark, I'm not a girl anymore, and I've been alone for eight years now. There aren't many men I'm interested in, so I'm not going to say no to someone who's in the same room with me. Tracy let you go. It's been what? Three years since your divorce became official, and I know you're dating. You're like the number one draft pick in the League of Fantasy Husbands, if only we had one. So no, I'm not going to lose a second of sleep worrying about what Tracy will think about you and me dating and other things. She blushed when she said the last part. Suddenly, I really wanted to be the one with whom she got back on the horse, so to speak. I handed her my cell phone, and she entered her number. Then, as I was getting my phone back, April and Robert came out of the hall looking for me. April knew who Wendy was, and the two of them chatted for a bit before Wendy said, I needed to go back and play Father of the Bride some more. I walked up to her, took both her hands in mine, leaned down and quickly kissed her on the lips. To be continued, I said quietly as Wendy blushed. We did all the usual wedding things, including cutting the cake, and Tracy was practically glued to me for the rest of the night. I think maybe April told her about my conversation with Wendy, and I assumed that maybe it was a little jealousy on her part. I have to admit I was a little flattered, even if it was three years later. When April and Robert returned to the hall, April approached Tracy and told her that they had just interrupted Mark and Wendy Adams, who appeared to be having intimate conversations. She said they kissed when they separated. Allison told Tracy that she had been watching Wendy and Mark on the dance floor and that Wendy looked like a teenager in love. Allison said she thought it was cute. Judging by the look on Tracy's face, she didn't think it was cute. After making sure everything was taken care of at the end of the night, Tracy and I were left alone in the hotel lobby. I knew she had come by taxi, so I offered to give her a ride home. She agreed on the condition that I let her buy me a drink at the hotel bar. Considering that this was the best thing Tracy and I had gotten along with in years. I agreed, and we walked down the hallway and sat down at a low table at the bar. 
The lady will have bourbon on the rocks, and I'll just have Staley, I told the waitress when she asked for our order. It's nice that you still remember, Mark, Tracy said. You're still the only woman I've ever seen who knows how to drink whiskey properly, I replied. Are you going to have fun with Wendy Adams? She then blurted out, putting a hand to her cheek and blushing when she realized the words that had left her lips. I regret. I didn't mean for it to come out this way, she said, stammering. I meant, are you going to date her? Over the past few years, you have dated a lot of beautiful women. I don't think you even missed me. Was it your plan to make me fail so you could sow some wild oats? I lowered my glass and stared into her blue eyes. She looked back at me, and her eyes seemed almost glowing. The silence between us lasted about 15 seconds as I formulated my answer. That's a nice try, Tracy, but I seem to remember someone sowing their wild oats while we were still married. To this day, you have never explained what made you treat me so disrespectfully when I would have been perfectly happy to grow old with you. Will this proposal still be discussed? She intervened. To say I was stunned would be a gross understatement. My jaw dropped as I stared at her. Okay, okay. I made a mistake, a terrible mistake, an incredibly stupid mistake. Tracy sighed. I was afraid that I was getting old, and I got carried away with great sex with a young guy to prove to myself that I could still excite men like before. Only in reality it was not different sex from the real physical act. It was the thrill of a new man, a young man, lusting after me. Only I wasn't smart enough to understand it back then, and when I started comparing them to you, well, you were lacking compared to what those kids could do. And the fact that you were just such a sweet, innocent guy while I was having fun made me think that you were just a smart ass. But it turns out I was wrong. After you left me, the thrill of the game disappeared. And after a while, the thrill of a new person. Or, rather, people disappeared. It was still an ego boost to have a young guy half my age want me, but nothing was happening emotionally. Damn it, Mark. I'd kill for a hug after good sex. Have you thought about dating someone your age, someone who was in your category, and has an idea about life, even if he can't hit the high notes like these kids? After all, Tracy, no matter how good you look, you're not 22 anymore either, I said. That's what I'm trying to do now, Mark, she said decisively. We had 30 good years together. Can you forgive my error in judgment and become mine again? Please. There were large tears in Tracy's eyes. Before all this started, I would have held her in my arms and tried to make the world a better place for her. Even now, after everything that had happened, part of me still wanted to do just that. In the end, to some extent, it was a victory. No, three years ago this might have been a victory. Now it was just a desperate apology. I shook my head slowly. First of all, we only had about 29 good years together. I definitely wouldn't call this last year a good one. But this is real life, Tracy. In real life, we won't succeed. Come on, let's take you home. Wendy Adams ended what had turned out to be a pretty good second bachelorhood for me. I waited a week to call her after the wedding. We ate at a nice seafood restaurant a couple of towns away. She wore a tight dress, and men kept staring at her all night. But unlike Tracy... She didn't seem to notice the attention. Her attention was solely focused on me. After a great meal and great conversation, we went back to her house for after dinner, drinks, and dessert. She poured us both a glass of cognac, which we casually drank in about five minutes. Then it was time for dessert. She stood up, took my hand, and led me to the upstairs bedroom. I noted that this was not the master bedroom and did not appear to be used very often. I completely understood her reluctance to have sex in the bed she shared with Earl. Wendy didn't need to tell me to be gentle with her. I knew she probably hadn't had sex with more than a couple of guys since Earl's death, if any. I knew that they were very much in love with each other. I did it very gently and slowly, starting with soft kisses on her lips as I helped her take off her clothes. She then started helping me out of mine as I started kissing her bare shoulders, then her upper breasts. Her beautiful big tits still had life in them, 
and stood out proudly against gravity. Tenderness gave way to passion, which I didn't even expect to see in this woman. When I finally looked up, she could barely breathe out, Enough! We kissed a little more, then just lay there entwined until I heard her breathing enter the sleep cycle. She looked like an angel, and I must have watched her sleep for a good ten minutes. In the last three years since my divorce, I have experienced an amazing sexual renaissance and enjoyed women of all ages. However, there was something about this connection. Yes, I was satisfied on a sexual level, but it seemed that I had an emotional attachment to Wendy. I just started to wonder if she felt the same way as I drifted into what turned out to be my best night of sleep in forever. Although it was no longer unusual for me to wake up in a strange bed in the morning, everything about this morning felt different. You know, almost like waking up on a lazy Sunday morning in the good old days with Tracy downstairs making breakfast and the girls running around her feet playing some kind of game. But there was no Tracy there, no laughing children. Just Wendy frying up some bacon, if my nose serves me right, and there was a pot of coffee already standing. I put on a t-shirt and trousers, I couldn't find my shirt, and staggered downstairs, not caring about anything. Then I found my shirt. Wendy was wearing my shirt and nothing else, with the sleeves rolled up to her elbows and the buttons only halfway buttoned. My shirt has never looked better. Hey, Sonia, I hope you don't mind that I borrowed your shirt. It just smelled like you and I wanted to stay around it for a while longer, she said. Well, then how about breakfast? I asked. Can a starving man get a little attention? She slowly sidled towards me as I spread my arms wide and pulled her into a tight hug. She smelled just like us last night, and I couldn't imagine a better scent in the whole world. Mmm, I moaned. Mmm, she moaned in response. We ate and discussed our plans for the day. It was Saturday, so we had all day to do whatever we wanted. We never discussed what I was going to do or what she was going to do. We discussed what we were going to do. We made several planes before I came up with the most brilliant idea of my life. This will sound completely stupid, but how about we get married today? I asked. You have an excellent IQ, she replied. I will do whatever you think is best. It was that simple. I knew the local justice of the peace had Saturday office hours, so I called to see if he was available at 4 p.m. And so it was, so we had just over seven hours to get cleaned up and ready for the wedding party. I needed a best man, and Wendy's 28-year-old son, Aaron, was more than happy to support me once I explained that the bride was his mother. He said he, his wife, and two-year-old daughter will make the hour-long drive to attend the ceremony. Wendy called her mother and asked her to be her maid of honor. When she asked, her cell phone was on speaker, and my future mother-in-law, whom I had never met, burst into tears before choking out an affirmative answer. I then called both of my daughters and invited April, Robert, Allison, and whoever she wanted to be, my plus one. Do you think I should invite my mother as my guest? She asked impudently. Only if you really want to, but I honestly would rather you didn't, I said. She's had a pretty rough time lately, and I don't want to look like I'm throwing my luck in her face. One of my best friends owned a nice restaurant in town, so I quickly called him and asked if his banquet room was available for the day. He said he would be happy to provide it for me, so I booked the room for a day. We both then invited a few other people who we thought would like to celebrate this wonderful occasion with us before I went to the best jewelry store to buy engagement rings. Tracy was leaving her favorite boutique with some bags in her hands when she almost literally ran into Wendy on the sidewalk. Although they weren't as close as they once were, they were still friends and had been for about 25 years. They chatted amiably on the sidewalk for a few minutes before Tracy noticed two rings on Wendy's left hand. My God, girl, they are absolutely amazing. Wendy blushed deeply as a light went on in Tracy's brain. Are you, are you, are you married to Mark? So, Tracy swayed a little and Wendy thought she might faint. She took her friend by the shoulder and helped her calm down. I didn't know. I'm really sorry, Tracy quickly apologized. We really didn't talk about it too much. It just all happened so fast, Wendy blushed fast. It's certainly not like the mark I know, Tracy said. Have you ever had the feeling that everything was so right that you just had to do it? 
Wendy continued. I mean, who would let a person like that get away? Wendy immediately raised her hand to her lips. That's not what I meant, Tracy, honestly. This is simple. Yes, I understand, Wendy. It's okay. Trust me. I know I'm an idiot. Learn from my mistakes and never let this man get away. Of course, there must be a lot of good guys out there, Tracy whined to her therapist, Dr. Ellen McForrest. They seemed to be everywhere when I decided to leave Mark. And then, they just all disappeared. You are a smart woman, Mrs. Robertson. You should have realized that there are very few good single men at your age. But you didn't even fish in those waters. Did you really believe you could catch a talented young guy and keep him? You should have known that sooner or later you might actually have to talk to him and make a life with him instead of just having sex with them. God, Doc. Real life really sucks sometimes. I'm standing on the back porch of the house Wendy and I bought together shortly after we got married ten years ago. For many reasons, we felt we should have our own home. It's a smaller house, with only two bedrooms. But it has a large living room and a large family room, so there's room to accommodate when we have all three kids and their families. We have already become grandparents six times. I'm grilling when Wendy comes out with a couple of whiskeys on the rocks. She hands one to me and I peck her on the lips. I can't help but marvel at how she looks 20 years younger than her 63 years. She still takes good care of herself, although her light brown hair has some gray in it. But she can still turn some heads when she dresses up for one of our casual nights out on the town. Hey, we may be old, but we're not dead yet. In fact, we still have fun in the bedroom twice a week and sometimes have a little fun in the shower. Anything is possible because medical science is a gift from God. Even though I loved Tracy with all my heart when we were married, I just can't imagine not spending the rest of my life with Wendy. She captured my heart in a way Tracy never did. In some twisted way, I should be grateful that Tracy cheated on me, because without that pain, I would never have had this pleasure. I run into Tracy every few months. She hasn't looked so good for a long time. She always looks sad and constantly apologizes. I always think about it, but I'm too polite to ever say the word thank you out loud. At 65, Tracy's large breasts no longer rise high, but with a good support bra, it was less noticeable. She got her cheesecake ass back, and as she walks through the mall, she realizes that men no longer pay any attention to her. As she headed to her car in the parking lot, she noticed Mark walking towards her. She made sure to stand straight as he approached. Hello, beautiful! he said affably, leaning down to kiss her on the cheek. Tracy couldn't help but blush at the compliment. The couple then engaged in small talk for a few minutes, mostly about their shared grandchildren, before Mark said it was time for him to move. He knew what would happen next. Mark, I'm really sorry, Tracy said. As usual, Mark looked straight into Tracy's eyes, hesitated and smiled without saying anything. He got into the car and moved forward, moving on with his life. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.